Greetings and welcome back to another Perspectives. Today we are going to have a look at the sunlit land of Spain. And somewhat ironically, I have with me my guest, a very talented individual who you might describe as a refugee from darkness. Uh, the irony as we proceed during the discussion will not be lost to you because despite the nice weather in Spain, there's some serious problems there. And uh, I guess that's a good way of introducing my guest, the uh, refugee from darkness for the Lord of Spain, a, a, a Spaniard with uh, some fair criticism of Spain um, that I believe is warranted from my perspective as well. So I think, uh, sir, we should probably, or senor, we should start, I mean, I could, I could go into boring prehistorical Spain, I don't think that would interest too many people. Let's start with the Spanish Empire, the so-called Golden Age, as it's, uh, as it's called, uh, roughly uh, this, the beginning of the 16th century to the middle of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. uh, Spain had this massive empire. Uh, I Possibly, I don't know in terms of you know, uh, actual area or land mass, but certainly one of the biggest empires yeah. in the world. And if you look around the world, in particular Latin America, Spain has a cultural and linguistic legacy because they sp all speak some variety of Spanish. Yeah, with the exception but, of Brazil, um, yeah. With the exception of Brazil, but, you know, you can't win them all, right? Um, <laughs> but one thing that would be critical about this, and we're talking about this, is, I mean, how much of that was due to coincidence and, and, and just luck? And how much of that was due to just being very uh, talented, intelligent, good strategist, and all this other stuff? So let's hear your opinion on this. Well... I think it's pretty much uh, the reason why Spain got uh, their empire. It's basically because of uh, geographics and uh, blade luck. I mean, mm. if you think about it, pretty much all the northern Mediterranean countries, like the Greeks, Romans, Spanish, Portuguese, all of them had an empire or a head that's up at some point in history. And the reason is because in this area, the food grows extremely well. So yeah. I think if... if uh, at the beginning, when there is not a huge amount of technology, basically your civilization limiting factor is basically how much food can you produce. Agreed. So, and that's right. If I might, I mean, we look at the beginning of quote-unquote human civilization, what's in English called the Fertile Crescent. Yeah, exactly. The Sumerians, I mean, it was the Euphrates River. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of opportunity for agriculture. It wasn't because there was some unique talent to these people. Exactly. You know? It's because basically they had the, enough food and they could uh, think about uh, other issues that just to be yeah. what I'm going to eat this week. So, and uh, something funny actually is that if you start in the Fertile Crescent, the civilization moved um, westwards. So first were the Greeks, then the, Ita the Romans, uh, the Italians, then the Spanish, then the Portuguese. So it went like all the way in that uh, direction. And I, I haven't been down the way away. But uh, the point is that <clears throat> once you have this, you have a Start, uh, start in superiority, let's say. And then, yeah, one guy comes with a crazy idea that, okay, let's go to India, going in the other direction, as uh, we usually go. And then this guy was laughed at by all the dukes uh, in every city-state of uh, Italy, and he went to, to Spain. And uh, he met the, the Queen Isabel, and uh, he asked her for money. And uh, this woman apparently had a weird fascination for the sea, and she didn't understood very well. And then she said, okay, yeah, let's give the guy some money. And they gave him three ships. I mean, three ships is nothing. I mean, any other nation could have give, give this guy three ships. So, and then the guy just starts uh, sailing west and so pop, yeah, you find America. And then yeah, you yeah, have the, yeah. you have the first food. And then of course you go back with some money. Right? We found it. Great. We have a new trade route. You exploit it a little bit. And then between the, how was it? The germs, the steel, and the powder, gunpowder, you conquer an entire continent. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's funny, I mean, briefly with Columbus, even in the United States growing up there, I mean, this guy was an Italian mm -hmm. who was sailing under the flag of Spain, and we even have our own myth mythology. We have rhymes that we learn. Mm -hmm. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, that kind of thing. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we still have that. We learn about the, the three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the... Santa Maria. Santa Maria, right. So there's a whole sort of mythology behind it. But in reality, uh, the guy was a 
I wouldn't say he was an idiot, but he, he certainly was a bumbling geographer. He didn't, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he literally thought that he had found in Asia, you know, like Indonesia or something, but uh, yeah. he was unaware of that. The guy died without knowing that he discovered a new continent, actually. Yeah. And uh, one side point, actually, uh, I find funny that uh, there is a conspiracy theory that, especially from the people from Barcelona, that they said that uh, Columbus was actually Catalan, not Italian. So, and they have, right. well, uh, they have some you know. proofs because he wrote some notes on the side of the notebook in Catalan or something like that. And that is right. Yeah, but just, just for fun's sake. So it, it's right. Well, fun fact. Not, not unusual among nationalists who are uh, always looking for ways to <laughs> boost, I guess, the perception of their, their country or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I think we can agree that how Spain rose to power was was basically just a common a combination of luck. I should also add that uh, in terms of geography and what I've I've read on this that mm -hmm. um, when you're actually shipping and uh, sh using ships and engaging in in, um, in navigation that the, the Spain is also in a particularly good yep. geographical uh, location. Mm -hmm. So if you actually compare the, the the sort of nautical feats of the Spaniards versus uh, frankly speaking, the Scandinavians and the Vikings in centuries earlier, mm -hmm. the feats of the Scandinavians are far more impressive yep. because the they didn't have the same uh, climate. They had much rougher seas and all this other stuff, and they still managed to, at the very least, discover Newfoundland. We know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, absolutely. But you know, history history is a combination of luck. Yeah. Um, so we have this this empire. Um, we have the Golden Age. We have uh, Spanish authors like uh, Cervantes. We have a tre tremendous production of art. Most of this, I would imagine, you could attribute to the huge amount of wealth that the, yeah. the uh, that the Spaniards were stealing from the New World. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, in some ways, it seems like the the height of Spanish power had very little to do with economic ingenuity or anything like that. It's just, the, yeah, mm -hmm. as you put it, put it guns, gunpowder, germs, uh, luck, yep. uh, theft, yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> Subjugation, yeah. basically. Right? Yeah, and, and that's how they, 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 they got there. Do you think, do you think when, and also the, the empire was quite large, mm -hmm. and I, I, you have to, I mean, I'm just theory crafting here, but the Romans were able to maintain... Uh, an empire for a fairly long time. It was mm -hmm. quite big. And yet, the Spanish Empire, comparatively speaking, it, uh, yeah. it didn't last quite as long. And they, the the amount of skill you would need to administer huge territories and uh, efficiently just seems... I mean, I, I, don't, I think it might have been lacking. Yeah. Uh, most... It seems most Latin American independence movements are already well underway in the 19th century. I mean, that is independence from Spain. Yep. Um, so, uh, it, do you think it's be because of the lack of skill and ingenuity that, that was involved in actually creating the Spanish Empire that uh, we're, we'll be talking about this in a bit more that Spain just sort of declined so rapidly? Mm -hmm. Um, I have a theory about um, mentioning uh, the Romans right now. I think one of the reasons why the Romans um, stayed so long, it was because um, there was no like major um, technological development in their era. Okay. So they had the superiority and then, yeah, okay. As I go back to the point before, uh, the limiting factor was the food. So right. as soon as you have uh, enough food to, for, fe for feeding the biggest army, yeah, spears and uh, catapults and mm -hmm. whatever they use, it was... It was that. Um, then yeah. with uh, with Spain, we had a, a, diff a totally different thing. And this is something I, I would like to ground a little bit. It's uh, one of the features of always having food is that you actually don't have to think ahead. You always, uh, you don't starve. I mean, you even in the winter in Spain, so you can get food. Meanwhile, if you're in the north, in Scandinavia, for example, if you don't think ahead and you don't plan You'll for die. the winter, you, you start to death. So I think that's uh, because may because of the reason maybe in the southern Europe there is like less of a forward thinking and planning uh, stra mm. strategizing let's say and maybe in the northern um, Europe you have like more like long term thinking let's say yeah and and I think this is a perfect example of how 
human beings interact with the environment mm-hmm. and what a tremendous influence it can have on, yeah. on people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Southern Europeans are traditionally, and to some degree justifiably, depicted as sort of lazy and mm-hmm. just, uh, but a lot of that has just to do with the climate. Absolutely. Um, you know, if all you need to do is go pick oranges off a tree and you can do it in the winter too, yeah. um, it's not a really big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so that whole planning aspect, I think, is 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 fairly relevant, and it might actually, long term, explain the relative success of Northern Europe yeah. over Southern Europe. Because, I mean, if we talk about this feedback loop between environment, what have you, uh, I I mean, if you look at the data, um, Northern Europeans have a higher average mean IQs than Southern Europeans, mm-hmm. and that's probably a result of just the centuries, the necessity to plan ahead. Yeah which uh, was reinforced in, in the terms of the genetic reproduction. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I, um, I absolutely, um, absolutely agree with that. And I'm absolutely convinced that this is the why Spain uh, failed as empire. Because at some point, I mean, the technology moved on, and the Spanish were stuck still in the... They, they suddenly lost their advantage, because suddenly the food was not the limiting factor, it was the quality of your cannons. And yeah. then the British had a much better art, navy, and uh, yeah. it just took one incompetent uh, king, it was uh, Ferdinand VII, I believe, who was just uh, Napoleon, went to him and told him, okay, can we put actually our army across your country so we conquer Portugal, we split it in three, and we should share the spoils? Oh, great, we will do that. And then when the whole French army was crossing Spain, they just attacked Spain. And it's like, yeah. it was like they took Spain by, by surprise. And then, of course, yeah, without the central power, Every country in Latin America started uh, getting their independence. So yeah. it was just a sheer incompetence. And uh, also, I mean, the, the Spanish Navy was defeated in the, the famous Battle of Trafalgar. And uh, one of the advantages that the Navy had in the Royal Navy had against the Spanish one was, first of all, that they were paying their sailors. So they were actually professionals. The other ones in Spain, nobody was getting uh, paid. So they have to pick up like uh, homeless people from the streets and land the troops to the to the boats and it was terrible and also the so it's management problem plus technological problem the british has much better cannons because they invented the caliber which was basically a ring where you put the 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 ball through like the gun ah, sorry the bullet through and if it doesn't fit it's not going it's going to blow up your cannon well the spanish didn't have that stupid piece of technology and half of their cannons were defective so mm. things like that. When technology moved on, Spain was left behind. Yeah, and uh, you know, if we, re- I want to certainly ter- talk about the interim history as well. But if you move forward a little bit or to the present, and let's face it, with supermarkets everywhere and exports and importing, uh, food is, in, at least in Europe, isn't really a huge factor. Mm-hmm. And so, since everyone, I mean, I know it's not entirely true, but everyone essentially has the same nutrition on some level, mm-hmm. uh, access to nutrition, yep. and you just you just see the the, the difference in performance mm-hmm. between, I mean, let's face it, Northern Europe is keeping Southern Europe alive uh, economically. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. it's, um, where will we be without all those uh, retired British people living in Marbella and bringing their money? Yeah, or you know, Germany. I mean, Germany arguably is the centerpiece of the uh, the eurozone. Mm-hmm. Um, so, effectively, we're talking about a, a set of coincidences and, and luck that led to the, the the ability to create the Spanish Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, probably in the 18th century, we could agree that it it's really starts to decline rapidly, mm-hmm. and Spain really becomes a more or less a non-factor in the 19th century yeah. as far as European powers are concerned. Pretty much. And when we fast forward to the 20th century, though, we the time of fascism, we have uh, our friend uh, Francisco Franco. Mm-hmm. Um, he held on to power for about uh, 40 years. Yep. Uh, is there? Do you think there was something remarkable about that guy? Uh, or was it just the, you know, he got lucky or something else entirely? Uh, honestly... I, um, I mean, I really don't like him because, well, well of course, I mean, it's a, it's a dictator. Nobody likes dictators. But I think it was like uh, not like Mussolini or like these people who was really handling Spain with an iron grip 
Uh, yeah, of course, there were some people who was executed for the most yeah. stupid reasons ever. But uh, still, I think it was not maybe so hard as other terrible dictators. So yeah, the people just, meh, why to do it? I mean, at the end of the day, they just came out of the war. There was like a huge, massive starvation after the civil war, which was slightly before the, um, the world war. And then, yeah, Spain was neutral during the war. And then, yeah, there's, there's, the problem with the food was more or less solved. And then, yeah, people go, man, let's keep it like this. I mean, uh, and he stayed. But and was, he stayed. Would you say, I mean, so the, the memories of him are, are pretty negative then? <laughs> Depends on who you ask. I mean, there is a very famous sentence that a lot of uh, old people in Spain use, ah, esto con Franco no pasaba. This with Franco will never have happened. Or something like that. Yeah, okay. well, I, I think this is not uncommon. You see this in Eastern Ger- Germans as well, and even people from the for- former Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. I think, well, you know, back in the day, it was it was better, right? Or yeah. it didn't have the same problems, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, no. yeah, it's not. It's not. This is not that unusual. I think. No. Uh, I think honestly, the people didn't don't care that much, or maybe I mean. Maybe I'm totally wrong because I have always been moving in a small circle of people, and I, I will have to take a poll to to see what people think. But I don't think he was highly appreciated. But yeah, uh, nothing, uh, nothing too serious. It was like, yeah, one more, one more guy. Right. So he died in his position. I mean, so there was. Oh yeah, uh, he is just under I think 1936 to 1975. If I uh, remember yes, right. Yes, that's uh, that's correct. And I mean, nobody yeah. like overthrow him or there was no like a gigantic revolution. Yeah, of course, there was like a lot of people climbing for the Republic, but nothing major ever happened. So mm. it was tolerated, I think. Yeah. So, hmm, interesting. What, uh, so when we talk about Spain and we're being realistic here, there's not much positive economically, <laughs> intellectually or anything going on there, is there? Not really. Actually, there was one thing which was, um, I read some years ago, uh, well, there was a map which was putting in every country what they were living in uh, the world in. So, for example, the United States have one positive quality, which was the number of Nobel Prizes, and the bad quality, which was like uh, death by lawnmower accidents or something like this. And uh, okay. Spain was number one in cocaine consumption per capita. And uh, number one in uh, kidney transplants. So mm. we had for some time like some very good uh, healthcare system, but now with the crisis, that's that's pretty much gone. So now, I mean, I guess this, it really just comes down to then asking you as an individual why you're obviously critical and it seems to be justified of Spain, but why you as an individual mm. decided to leave uh, Spain? What I mean. If, if you were to some no, just tell us why you don't want to live in Spain or work in Spain. Uh, well, um, yeah, I moved to, to Spain some years ago for doing my masters, and uh, once I left uh, Spain, suddenly I noticed I ended up in Northern Europe, and suddenly I noticed that everything worked so much better, and there was like uh, the bureaucracy was reduced to a minimum, everything was uh, working well, the possibilities, the working possibilities were incredible. I'm a scientist. So in Spain, if you want to do some research, there's pretty much nothing to do. And uh, yeah. it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. For example, the other day I read, if you want to uh, work in the University of Valencia, it doesn't matter if you have a Nobel Prize, you have to speak Valencia, Valencian. So they will not hire you unless you speak Valencian, which is like the most... Even, even though even, Castellano is the official language. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Valencian is also official in, in, the, in the region. I so, yeah, these guys put this rule. So basically, if you have like the top-notch scientist ever not, with three Nobel Prizes, and he wants to go there, uh, 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 unless you speak Valencian, you don't teach here. I don't care how good you are. And mm-hmm. then it's everything. It's uh, the nepotism in the university. It's, uh, we call it the endogamia, the endogamy. It's a... Uh, it's so widespread. You need to get like a, a godfather or something to or somebody who leads you in. The, the money is ridiculously low. I mean, the salary for for a postdoctoral researcher, which is what I'm doing right now, it's peanuts. 
and then the memes. I mean, I have been in labs over there, and I have seen, been seen the labs pretty much. In well, I have worked in three different countries in Europe, and honestly, there is a huge difference in level. I mean, all the, all the machines you can get. It's uh, so. So if you put everything together, it's like, yeah, I like my country, my family is there, the food is great. That's something that you really have to say. Yeah, but, I like the food. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But honestly, I I like my job and I want to do it uh, properly. And uh, honestly, call me selfish. I like to be properly paid for my job. So. Yeah, no, I t- totally understand that. <laughs> uh, and it, you know, you talked about meeting Spaniards, other Spaniards abroad who feel a similar way. No. Uh, that's amazing. Also, um, we call it uh, in Spain the the brain leak. The, mm. I have been pretty much all around the world, and uh, always Spanish scientists everywhere, and really good ones. Actually, people like really hardworking people. It's like if you're living in an environment where basically everything is against you, and you want to work, and everything is just not rewarding you for that work. Of course, you go out. I mean, I was in Tokyo, in uh, for a I lived there for a month. I was working there. And uh, in the university where I was working, suddenly I start hearing Spanish. I turn around, yeah, two Spanish engineers going there everywhere in the world. And this is the highly intelligent people, the only people who actually want to work. And it's like, yeah, they are going out of the country. So I think if there is any problem in Spain, it's going to get worse because of this. I mean, you're losing all the talent that uh, that we have. That we are exporting it yeah. for, for the rest of Europe, especially. And, yeah, I mean, if that's the case, it seems to be it could be a well a long term problem. Oh in yeah, Spain. Uh, no, no, no. I have absolutely zero hope for for the future of the country. The country is <laughs> functionally bankrupted, and uh, it has a huge uh, problem with pensions. We also, right. due to the nice weather and the Mediterranean food, we have one of the longest uh, lifespans in in the planet. So. And uh, the childbirth is <laughs> ridiculously low. And with a 25% right. of unemployment, you're not getting many immigrants. So mm. if you put uh, A plus B together, you get a huge problem with pensions. It's already great, and it's going to be worse. And uh, honestly, there were elections, and I haven't heard a word about pension reform. So, but Of course, <laughs> this was an issue in Greece as well, oh, yeah. uh, with pensions. Mm. So Yeah, there is a huge parallel, uh, I think, pretty much all the south, uh, southern Europe. Mm. Portuguese seems to be a little bit more. They think a little bit more with their heads, I would say. Yeah, that's my impression too. I mean, every Portuguese person I talk to does seem to be more just kind of with it, and I don't, I don't exactly know why because the climate isn't too different. Yep. Um. I. Hmm. That's a that's an interesting thing because I mean, it's pretty much the same people as in Spain. We have pretty much the same history. We have seen, we have seen, been the same country for some years. And it's like, mm. yeah, so you have totally different mentality and totally, I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's a weird oddity. I mean, every, every, it, it, it's has, strange, but I, th- I think it's worth at some point in time maybe investigating because mm-hmm. d- to explain those contrasts would be a very interesting thing. Why, you know, it's not identical, but there's so many similarities and yet we, we don't see the, um, you know the the decline, the same decline, the complete decline in Spain. In fact, you could argue that compared to Spain, Portugal's doing reasonably well. You know, it, it still has its issues, but uh, I think it's still okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I think from southern Europe, the only one which is slightly better is uh, Italy, and that's because mm-hmm. of the industry of the north. I mean, if you compare like North Italy versus South Italy. I read the statistics. On- yeah, that, that's always been the case. I mean, if anyone's ever been to a place like Sicily, yeah, oh god, it's uh, versus uh, maybe Torino or something. It's it's night and day. Yeah, I mean, they might as well be different countries. Uh, it's it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. I mean, the southern cities also compared to the there tr- tends to be trash everywhere. It's, yeah, it's it's just really weird. I I can't stand southern Italy. I don't mind the north too much, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's it's rather incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're we're talking about sort of a, a a prognosis of doom here, I guess. There's no, there seems no point of salvation along this path. Uh, would you say that's accurate? Uh, absolutely. I mean, unless they discover how to 
turn, I don't know, cow milk in gold or something like that. <laughs> it's, uh, I see that there is uh, pretty much no hope. It's, uh, and especially right now, we, as I mentioned, we just had elections and uh, we are currently without a government because there was, uh, there was not enough uh, votes for, no, sorry, there was not enough uh, seats for the biggest country party to get uh, elected. So now we have to repeat it, the elections. And we have been like one year without a government and all the guys who are coming new, they have some crazy ideas. Uh, the left is gaining popularity. And uh, well, it's, uh, it's not my favorite thing, let's say. So I, I really don't see no. this happening, uh, this uh, going any better. In contrast to the rest of Spain, Catalonia is is reasonably successful. I guess yep. a lot of it's to do with tourism, but still. Yeah. Um, you explained to me previously that there's a huge amount of economic dependency oh, yeah. from the provinces outside of Catalonia, or well, the rest of Spain, basically, mm -hmm. on Catalonia. Catalonians resent this, and I'm not even... I mean, just purely from a practical perspective, I'm not necessarily talking about sort of the nationalism there. Mm -hmm. Um, how, I mean, you don't have to be pre precise, but I mean, without Catalonia, let's say, and we could talk about this a bit more, we should, without, let's say Catalonia defects or, you know, goes independent. Yeah, goes its own way, let's say. Right. Uh, Spain would suffer immensely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I always uh, tell the same story. I mean, there are like, uh, Spain, it's basically Madrid, the Basque country, Catalonia, and desert. It's, uh, there is nothing else apart of these three big regions. Those are the ones that are producing everything for the rest of the country, pretty much. I mean, statistically. And of course, the government from, from Madrid takes money from the Basque country and from Catalonia and they pour it into the south. And the south is horrible, seriously. It's, uh, if you check the statistics at every metric, education, health, economics, everything is, uh, and the money that they take from Catalonia just disappears. It vanishes yeah. in a, this festering corruption that we have there. And of course, the Catalonians are pissed. And the Basques too. And a lot of Madrid, the people from Madrid too, but Madrid is the central government, so yeah, they have to, they, they kind of accept it better. But yeah, these two regions, of course, they want to be independent. And honestly, I don't blame them for that. And uh, something which is actually interesting is that uh, you probably have heard about the uh, Terrorist, uh, the independentist um, band, uh, ETA. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They were putting a lot of bombs and killing a bunch of people. Oh, okay. Um, That's nice. Uh, so, so until, I think it was 2009, that they were finally eliminated, let's say. And yeah. still, the Catalonian uh, independence is way more advanced than the Basque independence. Because in, in Catalonia, it was like more peaceful and democratic, let's say. In the Basque, uh, they tried with bombs. And then you, can, you have the proof that actually violence didn't solve the problem. That the other guys are doing much better. Everybody's now talking about Catalonia leaving the Spain. Nobody's talking right now. The Basque country leaving Spain. So that's, a, that's an interesting point. And yeah, honestly, of course, Spain doesn't want to leave uh, Catalonia. It's like if you have a company and your most productive worker it uh, decides to go somewhere else, then you have a problem, especially when you only have three workers. So. Yeah, yeah. But from your perspective, and I guess you're pretty neutral on this, but I mean, they're justified in, in wanting to leave, I guess you could say. Uh, I believe so. I mean, honestly, it's, uh, that's at the end is how much do you give in taxes and how much do you get in return? If you're uh, in a net loss, in a totally selfish uh, standpoint, why to stay? Also, yeah. I mean, they have their their own language. They have their own. They have a lot of. I mean, they have a lot of. Uh, um, like for example, they have their own police. They have their own uh, education system. Their own healthcare system. So they have been given a lot of uh, leeway right now. But yeah, they are still giving, getting the money taken out. So if they want to do it, honestly. Let them vote for it and uh, let them decide. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, no, I mean, uh, pretty, pretty, sorry. sorry, continue, sorry. No, at the end of the day, what the uh, people was extremely worried, it was like, okay, but if Catalonia leaves the Spain, is Barcelona still going to be playing in the Spanish league? Because it's not going to suck. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, that's the biggest. <laughs> this, sure. this seems to be, uh, I guess, symbolic of, of the myopia. Yeah, that explains of, uh, that's, that sentence explains Spain in <laughs> extremely well. Yeah, well, that's kind of depressing. I, I, yeah. Hmm. Right. So the long-term prospects are, are bad. Uh, do you foresee something in Spain that's similar to what happened in Greece? Uh, like uh, you mean the arrival of an uh, extreme left party and bankruptcy and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think that's just uh, a matter of time. Mm. Honestly, I I see absolutely no way out. I mean, the, the mathematics are there. I mean, the, you cannot create money out of in, uh, of nowhere, and you have a huge debt problem. Yeah. So and you are growing that debt every day. So it's a ticking bomb. So I absolutely believe that this is going to happen, and uh, I'm, it's a it's a it's a pity because actually I was thinking every time that I finish a job somewhere, I always say, well. Let's consider the possibility of going back to Spain. I check with my friends there and no, 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 don't come. It's worse than the last time, as you ask. Mm. So I think it's getting worse and worse. And uh, honestly, I don't see a way out. Especially, well, the, no, sorry, the things that uh, they would have to do for fixing the country, they are so insanely unpopular that the politician that even mentions them, they're out immediately. Well, I would imagine you would essentially have to undo a huge cultural historical legacy. Yeah. Um, you might, frankly speaking, <laughs> something, I don't know, you might need to change the, the genetics of the people too, possibly. Yeah, something like that. Uh, it just, it's not going to happen. No. And, uh, I mean, obviously... I mean, I'm sure you heard of Brexit, this sort of Britain yep. exits from, right? So I think that the EU is going to dissolve naturally. I don't think there's going to need to be a referendum. But when places like Spain mm -hmm. capsize and just essentially explode, or rather implode is a better way of putting mm -hmm. it, they implode. And yep. Italy at, at some point will be behind that, mm -hmm. mostly because of southern Italy. Uh, you know, there won't really be much of an EU left. And... People are going to see the senselessness of trying to preserve something that Doesn't is highly artificial. No, absolutely. Uh, for me, honestly, I like the idea of, of Europe. I have profited mm. immensely for it. I mean, yeah, same man. I'm not German, but uh, I have a passport from a European country that allows me to live and work here. Yeah, no. so. and I think for the average citizen, uh, Europe is extremely convenient. I mean, it's, uh, you can, for example, I mean, I decided to move out of Spain and then I was arriving to any country. I mean, I have lived in four countries in Europe and it's like every time you just arrive, go to the town hall, register yourself, not a problem. It's a no visa, no any requirement. You can move. Around. Yeah, I love it too. I, I mean, and this is my, I guess, selfishly my concern. That will be, that will be a pity. I yeah. It's because ultimately it's, it's people, people like us who, who are living in different countries than our, you know, official countries or passport says mm. that are, you know, uh, trying to just do work or do what, live our lives. Yeah. And essentially because of all the problems in the EU, we might uh, have to suffer. And I, I still think in theory, this is a good idea, allowing labor mobility. I mean, the people, yes, there are people abusing the system and, and they'll leave the country and go to the UK to take welfare. But I was just, telling my friend here, I just, he's, he asked me, well, why don't you just, you know, go on welfare? So I don't believe in that. I mean, there are plenty of people who don't believe that and just, yeah. you know, they don't, they don't necessarily, you know, at some point in time, I might go back. I've never lived, lived in Hungary, you know, back to Hungary. But for now, I don't see the point. And hmm. it's a shame that, that ultimately the destruction of the EU will ruin that labor mobility because I think that's such yeah. an important feature. Hmm. And you don't need all the, um, I guess, I can only call it uh, political profiteering yeah, sure. that goes on in, in places like Brussels and Strasbourg and other places to maintain the labor mobility, which I think ultimately strengthens uh, strengthens the countries, I guess, and some of uh, the EU. Hmm. I mean, the fact that you and other very intelligent Spaniards are leaving Spain, yeah. uh, this, is, this is a good thing. So 
all these other countries are profiting. Well, what's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah, I think that's actually a it's actually a very positive thing. And honestly, if I may be honest, uh, they actually paid me my PhD. So I got a European grant. So I'm kind of uh, I know where my bread is better. <laughs> but uh, yeah. no, but I think there's there's all these stupid over regulations like European Euro regulations, and they get into business that they shouldn't get into. I mean, it's uh, or these um, subsidies to agriculture and stuff like that. They have like a, absolutely artificially inflated uh, system. And uh, that's ridiculous, honestly. Why cannot be Europe just, okay, labor mobility, cash mobility, and that's it. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice idea. You don't need this, what do you say, political profiteering, this yeah. messing around with, with people. You don't even need a, like a central bank. I mean, right, if you want to keep the euro, but nothing like, uh, just let people move around. I mean, it's, uh, oh, agreed, agreed, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, and this this is what really annoys me. Um, you know, I'm sort of a euro skeptic on most issues, but mm-hmm. no, uh, if they hadn't uh, essentially exploded the system, invited tons of third world immigrants, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, ru- and ruined what it was intentionally meant to be—that mm-hmm. is, the ability for people within the European Union to have flexibility and labor mobility, mm-hmm. which often adds to the local economies they move to. Yeah. I mean, your Intelligence has profited uh, the laboratory you work at. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't really see the issue uh, with that. And mm-hmm. instead, we're, yeah, everything is falling apart. Yep. Southern Europe will be the first to fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are going to resent it. We have the growth of uh, left wing nationalism. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, we talked about that. Yep. One thing that keeps on popping up is uh, the alt right, mm-hmm. yeah. which I. I I've been trying to decipher. I think it's largely just about sort of some kind of white nationalism. Yes. That's usually what they talk about. Um, you know, th- this is. You know, I, I don't. I don't see any any good end from from all of this. Hard to be positive mm-hmm. about really anything, but you know, we got to go where the evidence leads us. Now, actually, I, I wanted to go back to one point that we made before about uh, cl- sure. how climatology affects uh, affects the country. Right. And, um, yeah, what we were saying before is like, okay, the northern countries, okay, you have to plan ahead. So that gives you an advantage. Another mm-hmm. thing that, uh, these cold temperatures and starvation produces is a lot of, um, let's call it hospitality or, how do you call it? um, yeah, you want to help people, charity, let's say. Because if you don't help each other, you're going to have a very big problem. And that's, yeah, there, that's also where I think that uh, the welfare from the northern countries come. In the southern, we don't have that much welfare. I think, is this... Is it's interesting you mention that. There are, there are theories in the alt-right that I've heard that white people... I don't even like... The, the, white, the term white people is so nebulous. I wish they'd... Actually, they never respond. I said, why don't you just talk about European haplogroups? That would be more yeah. useful. But anyway, quote-unquote white people, mm-hmm. whatever that means, are, are naturally more generous. I mean... No, I've never heard a good justification for that. Apart from sort of yours, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it would be an impossible to measure, but yeah, maybe that's one of the reasons. Yeah. And that's actually what uh, I think it's going to to bankrupt them. I mean, in our case, it's like political incompetence and uh, massive debt, and for them, it's going to be pathological altruism. Yeah, I mean the the. Um the phrase pathological altruism is something that you hear very, very often in uh, in right wing in, in the sort of alt right circles, but increasingly it's becoming sort of a more mainstream uh, term. Look, yeah. I mean, while we're on the topic, I think occasionally the alt right is is right, correct about certain things, but essentially their 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 vision, uh, to my mind, is is fairly myopic. Uh, like I said. The white race is something that's very poorly defined. I mean, because are they talking about Northwestern Europeans, Eastern Europeans? I'm I'm an Eastern European. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are they talking about when they mean the white race? And they and I'm going to be making a video about this, but they also misappropriate science and use it when it's convenient. So it's one of these things where yeah, sometimes they're they're making some correct points, but they're not doing it because they're trying to understand a situation. They're doing it because they're ideologically motivated. And um, 
ultimately that's not uh, that's not a, a good way to try to understand the world. But no, they just don't like uh, immigrants uh, uh, getting married with a woman. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, ultimate, yeah, pr- pr- pretty much. That's ultimate cause. <laughs> or, or they, you know, from a MGTOW perspective, something that completely doesn't resonate with me, and, you know, you're a man going your own way too. So this idea of, you know, they'll complain about the poor white women that are getting attacked, and I, I, I don't feel anything. I don't know why I should particularly care about the so-called poor white women. Um, or, you know, p- white people not breeding enough. I, I just I don't care about that stuff. This is something that'll never resonate with me, probably. Um, yeah. And I, I don't. I, I just. But although there are interesting predictions that the alt right will be the next big thing, you know, mm-hmm. now it's still feminism and SJWism and all this other garbage. Yeah. But the next thing will be sort of this whole race discussion and and the alt right. And I'm, I'm interested if that happens. I'd be interested to see what what happens because you know. Only a fool doesn't believe in the realities of population genetics, oh, yeah. but uh, on the other hand, mixing it with certain ideological uh, intentions doesn't seem particularly wise to me. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, at the end, uh, society is basically like an, like a pendulum. It oscillates. I mean, it goes like way in one direction, and then when when you get too far and start fucking up things, you have the reaction. I mean, it's like, mm. uh, for example, the, if you look in Germany, for example, the more, the biggest amount of uh, neo-Nazis in Germany, yeah. you have them on East Germany, which was the communist part. So yeah. you have communism and then you have like gigant reaction against it. And yeah, I think, uh, we have been like maybe too goody good, too touchy feely. And suddenly, yeah, we need, uh, these guys came out and said, okay, look at what your pathological altruism has brought. Let's try something diametrically opposite, uh, opposite. And then, yeah, I mean, that's actually... This, this is kind of se- this seems to happen. I think that's not a bad analysis. That <laughs> the pathological altruism has sort of led to this intense sort of, I guess, racially oriented tribalism. Like I said, yeah. I, I get annoyed because they never define what it means to be white. But anyway... Mm-hmm. Um, like, are Spaniards white? I don't know, because some are tan. So yeah. is it not just... The, the funny thing about them, too, is that they'll say, they're the first ones to say, oh, race isn't just about skin color, but they, they define themselves With the by, by, yeah, like, you're white. So if you're a tan Spaniard, is are you not white? Well, I don't know. So anyway... It actually gets pretty but, dark if I get enough sun. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Well, I I, yes, I burn in the sun. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a pale motherfucker. But, um, yeah, so, I mean... Would they consider you part of the the white? Re- it's just it's very confusing, mm-hmm. but it it does seem to be a counter reaction mm-hmm. uh, to to well the opposite uh, of this. You know, let's give everyone everything, and I don't like any of it. But I don't like giving everyone everything, and I don't like mm-hmm. uh, you know sort of pseudoscience and misapplying science oh, and this obsession with race. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't see a way out. I mean, it's just, it's as you said, it's a pendulum. Mm-hmm. So right now we're dealing with the stupidity of SJWs and whatever, mm. and yeah. actually, I, I mean, this is, I mean, we're, it's a little bit off the topic of Spain. I know we're going to other territory, yeah. but it bears, it's worth mentioning that when you deny certain things of realities of the world, you give cover to other people. Mm. So the fact that typically on the left, no one ever talks about things like population, population genetics mm-hmm. or, you know, allele frequency. Yeah gives cover to these people, and then they think they're special mm. by pointing out certain things. Yeah. Oh, look at this population, what they do, or look at this. It's not special. It's, you can just observe it. It's there. It's pretty obvious. Most recently, uh, nine out of the ten men in the, uh, the uh, London Marathon were Eastern African. I think eight out of the ten women. You know, big surprise. But they, they give cover, and I think in some sense, the SJWs on the left, uh, the far left, are feeding into this whole... Uh, rise of essentially so-called this poorly defined white nationalism. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, at least give credit where it's due. At least Hitler had the idea of this sort of Aryan thing. It was kind of a dr- Germanic thing. So mm-hmm. these guys have got to give, give better definitions. I've been trying to understand this phenomenon. I, I don't quite understand it, but it mostly seems to be about some nebulous uh, white race and the preservation of the white race <sighs> and something like that. And I also find it ironic on for the with the alt right is that. They talk about the great thinkers like Newton and some of these other guys, Leibniz, mm-hmm. 
These guys were essentially mixed. They, they never got married. They weren't interested in women. They just were doing their own thing. It, it's a it's a weird it's a weird constellation. But uh, yeah, I, I guess honestly, for me, I have never met personally any. Well, I actually met one, which was like one white supremacist. And honestly, oh, okay. the, the guy was a dumbass. Uh, it was like oh, uh, they tend to they tend to be, frankly speaking, pretty low IQ on average. <laughs> I mean, this is my observation. Absolutely. I've looked. I've looked at some of their sites. There's one called the Daily Stormer. It's got some pretty fun, funny cartoons every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, they had one really funny one. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the I call him Mark Sugar Mountain, yeah, yeah. that's his name in Germany, <laughs> yeah. who married a ethnically Chinese person. Oh my god! And they said they had this funny article like um, like the 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 the, the Jew Asian hybrid something something and it, uh, but I mean it's not exactly rigorous science so. Uh, I think it's basically people who doesn't have anything going on in their lives and they just uh, try to feel superior to other people by this mean. Like, oh, I'm right. Well, look, go- I'm not. I think emotionally, I can, I can at least intellectually understand where it comes from. Because if you think about it, if you're, you feel disenfranchised, mm-hmm. if you feel like your country is being overrun, let's say in the United Kingdom. I'm saying this tongue in cheek, guys. I don't really use the term "packy," but. The packies are coming and it's ruining everything. Mm-hmm. And of course, you're going to feel sort of um, backed into a corner, I guess, and then you're going to sort of react to that as well. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't. It doesn't resonate with me. I, I think really intelligent people, and not universally. I'm not saying I'm really intelligent, but people with a shred of intelligence usually don't get too obsessed with all these tribalistic things because yeah. it's just not. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And actually, and that's one of the good things that I'm going to remark about Spain. Going back to the topic of the, of the okay. country, it's uh, in Spain until probably until the crisis, we have actually the biggest percentage of immigrants in Europe. In absolute numbers, we were beaten by by Germany because Germany is twice the, the size. Yeah. But uh, in Spain, we have a ton of immigrants, a lot of Latin American people. A lot of people from from Morocco, they just cross the the Latin America too. A, a ton, uh, a lot of them returning to the empire. Yeah, actually, they a lot of people from Ecuador, especially. I think that was the main the main contributor. I mean, in Spain uh, before 2008, you could make uh, 2,000 euros per month clean uh, laying bricks with uh, with a housing bubble. It was absolutely over the top. So yeah, of course, a lot of people from Latin America came to. Um, to us, a lot of people from Morocco and uh, North Africa, they came, a lot of people from Romania, also because the language is, uh, is similar, and uh, there has never been or like any mainstream uh, right-wing uh, racist, nobody has ever blamed the immigrants, at least not in a public uh, sphere, not like in France, we don't have a national front, the front you know, or we don't have like uh, AFD or the British League, uh, British Defense League, or something. we don't have anything like that. Even though the, the amount of immigrants that we had, it was much bigger than any other country. So, yeah, we can say that it's a pretty tolerant country. Yeah, although I suppose some people would argue that tolerance is not a good thing, but I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I really I just don't have any vested interest in any of these sort of uh, identity politics groups of any sort. I just like to sit back and observe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had a... She had a guy send me a message from the alt right. He said he used to like what well, he used to, you know, past tense, <laughs> like to watch my videos, but he found I was too nihilistic and this and that, and uh, you know, sent me some links uh, regarding the alt right and how I could investigate, and hmm. certainly interested in understanding its structure and what they're about, but uh, I, I don't, re- it doesn't resonate with me at all, hmm. and I think uh, most MGTOW minded men would, uh, well, let's put it this way. If you're going your own way, and particularly you're interested not just in the, you know, fuck marriage, get laid kind of thing, yeah. and you're interested in sort of the intellectual side, mm-hmm. of course, the, the, the MGTOW are brothers of the mind. We're ne- we can't be, by the definition, we can't be brothers of the, of the blood. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the, the approach most, I guess, sort of mentally inclined MGTOW-minded mm-hmm. men take is that, you know, look, we're trying to understand the world, ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so the most important thing is that we have good ideas and, of course, these, that these good ideas unite us yeah. rather than... Uh, Some tribalistic... Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm I'm talking to a Spanish guy. I'm the American son of Eastern of an Eastern European immigrant. It's like this this doesn't like that shouldn't be a, a a limiting factor in how we interact if there can be productive conversation, exchange of ideas, and indeed the spreading of knowledge. So yeah, no, I mean, that's my perspective, no. and I know a lot of people disagree, but that's that's why while I certainly am I'm agree it's uh, that there are genetic populations and differences mm -hmm. uh, i don't i don't make this the my, my mantra on how i interact with people and it's kind of silly to do so i think for me honestly yeah no i mean and the differences and the, the all these genetic differences are trends at the end of the day you can have an extremely smart uh, moroccan guy who i actually worked uh, when i was in Spain with a guy from morocco and he was extremely good and it's like Okay, do you want to kick him out because he's uh, North African? Yeah, I, I and this guy exactly. is more productive than half of the Spanish I have met here. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, genetic population differences has come down to allele frequency, yeah. which can, you know, come up pretty much uh, anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I mean, look, uh, that, that's the point. Uh, we need to ultimately treat people as individuals. Um, there are dumb people everywhere. I mean, you should see all the dumb white Germans in my fucking neighborhood. They're everywhere. I mean... Uh, people that that can't even string coherent sentences together because they're so drunk. So, um, no, am I gonna you know, side with someone merely because he's white uh, and a fucking idiot, or am I gonna side with someone who I have a lot more in common with intellectually uh, from a completely different part of the world? Well, I think the latter. But yeah. anyway, that's just my view. No, absolutely, and uh, I think the, it's interesting to to look at the trends and the differences, but in a theoretical point of view. I mean. It's, uh, it's just, yeah, um, okay, human race has all this variation, and it's uh, very interesting to understand it, and um, very, it explains a lot, actually, about uh, yeah, history. Yeah, I mean, and about, uh, absolutely. So. If I just want to make a statement regarding that, I think the usefulness of understanding and acknowledging population genetics is just, it's, it's the following. It explains, um, it explains trends, and I think it's also a good reason why you shouldn't be so interested in all this sort of utopian egalitarianism. So okay. no one is running around in the United States saying, God damn it, the NBA is filled with 75% West Africans. Uh, we need to get some, I don't know, some Northwest Europeans and some Eastern Africans and maybe some, some Chinese. Uh, nobody says that. They just accept it as it is. Mm -hmm. And likewise... Um, if you see in the scientific community that it's mostly, you know, Asians and whites, I don't, none of that's a problem. And I think the, the differences, the population genetic differences, the trends they have, the means mm -hmm. help to explain this. Yeah. You know, it, we don't necessarily need certain kinds of people. We need competent people, yeah. but, but, and, and it, it's only an expl explanatory mechanism to me. So just as they don't worry about the NBA, about getting more white people in, mm -hmm. Uh, the average IQ of uh, blacks is lower, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in, in sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of that's due to nutrition. But even in the United States, where it's about 85, yep. that probably explains why, among other things, you don't see lots of black scientists compared to Asians mm -hmm. or, or, or white people. But, but wait, that's I not know something one you need to black change. scientist, so hmm. that invalidates your entire argument. So. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> that, well, that's the whole thing, is that if... if if individuals defy the trend, yeah. that's great. So if you find some guy, some Chinese, you know, Japanese guy who's tall and he's an amazing basketball player, mm -hmm. he should absolutely, if he can, if he's competent, play in the NBA. I mean, he's an, he's an exception. He, I guess, would you say he'd be the right of the um, distribution curve of that population group? Just like that, that's the thing. If, if some guy is, if a black guy is 160 IQ and you know, obviously he's far to the right of the distribution curve. He should be obviously involved in science. There shouldn't be any barriers. But at the same time, we shouldn't try to artificially promote things yeah. just because we view it as, as unfair. And I think population genetic differences help to explain certain things. And we can just say, look, maybe we don't need to change this. Maybe we should just accept that. That's my view, at least. You know, accept it and uh, use it uh, on the best of your abilities. And yeah, exactly. That's also something I I would like to discuss about uh, Spain. Going back to the topic, mm, sure. It's um, one key problem that I also see in Spain. It's how do you determine who is the best? I mean, in uh, for example, I tend to compare a lot the um, the German education system because I have colleagues who are German and the, um, the Spanish education system. 
In Spanish education system, for example, everybody is the same. You have like one school, one class, one level. There is no differences. You put everybody together because everybody is the same. What happens is that everybody who does, who is below the average, they're going to have a lot of problems. If you are over the average, you're going to get bored to tears and you're going to fail also high school. I know a lot of people with really high IQ also who failed uh, high school in Spain or never did it to the university or stuff like that because it's I aimed to the to the middle. So you produce basically mediocrity. In German, yeah. in the other way, in the other way, you have this three level school system, and uh, like when you're eight, you're already sorted out. Okay, are you going to be like a waiter? Are you going to be like a car mechanic, or are you going to be a doctor or an engineer? It's very good. I've, I, uh, sir, I've, I've always thought that the Germans, it's not perfect, but one thing it does really well, instead of this insane, I would say, an Anglo-Saxon idea of everyone goes to university. Oh, Nobody thinks that way in Germany. Uh, you know, if you're not smart enough to go to university, then you don't go. But maybe you'll become a carpenter, which is also productive and important. I mean, it's just... Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah. And, um, I see that uh, a lot, for example, in... Uh, do you know that what are the two countries in in Europe with the highest percentage of people with uh, university diplomas? Uh, I could guess. Let me guess. It's probably Spain and the United Kingdom? Uh, Spain and Denmark. Oh, okay. Actually, in Spain, 40% of the population has a university degree. And what we are lacking, it's actually skilled workers. Uh, there was uh, this study in the Basque country that, uh, yeah, we have too many people with degrees and not too many metal workers. We need metal workers. And uh, things like that. In Germany, with this distribution, okay, you get like very good engineers and very good scientists, which are going to produce a lot of wealth that then you can redistribute. And uh, you're also going to cover the the middle ground, like the, the blue collar jobs, which are actually extremely important. And for some reason in Spain, those are looked uh, down to. Hmm. Here, it's perfectly, res- in Germany, it's perfectly respectable to to be a, a car mechanic or a carpenter. Yeah. It's, uh, and I think that's actually one of the key uh, differences between the, yeah. uh, between the two uh, processes. Yeah, well, I think that certainly in the recent decades, there's been a lot of negativity towards so-called blue-collar work, but at the end of the day, <laughs> it tends to be more profitable yeah. and certainly more useful than taking useless degrees in sociology or women's studies. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. The other day, for example, I was uh, in the lab, some glass were broke, and it's uh, something that you cannot buy. You have to build it by yourself. So we went to a glass blower in the university, and I said, okay, I need this with this measurement. Is that okay? Okay, the guy says, okay, it will um, it will take me two weeks to have it. Said, two weeks? This is a basically a bent glass pipe. I mean, it will not take you that long. So, yeah, but we have a lot of work. It's, uh, I immediately thought, maybe. I'm going to open my own glass blower because it seems that <laughs> there is a lot of uh, a lot of demand for this job that uh, is not being covered. So, so this guy. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. I, I don't know if I'd do it now, but if I could go back in time, hmm. I certainly would consider uh, some sort of training in something that's uh, more you know, practical or whatever. Hmm. It's something that you can't discount, but. Uh, yeah, you know. Right now with the internet. Uh, a lot of white collar works, you can outsource them, send them to India or to China. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you want your pipes in your house uh, uh, cleaned because uh, something is leaking, then you you really cannot uh, send your kitchen to China. So you have to bring somebody yeah. here and now. So I think this is actually, I mean, Aaron Clary, I know that <laughs> a lot of uh, people don't like him in these circles, but uh, he has been saying this for, for years. Aaron Clary, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, look, uh, clock, uh, broken <laughs> clock is right uh, twice a day, too, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, so, so, as I was saying before, the alt-right, you know, they make some accurate observations occasionally. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, that, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. When they're, when it's accurate, I don't disagree with it, you know? Yeah, no. And, uh, honestly, I think it's, uh, and also, I think blue collar jobs actually offer also the the ability of uh, having something useful, uh, useful skill. So like for example, absolutely. For, yeah. for me, I'm this highly educated person. Okay, my skills are pretty much worthless outside of the laboratory. It's uh, 
were the only time in my life that I actually have used my knowledge of science outside of the, the lab. It was in Japan because I got sick and I needed a, a medicine for the stomach. And I went and I painted the formula of the of the of the medicine to the pharmacist because he didn't speak English. Yeah. I said, okay. I, oh, look, I I agree with you. I'm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be completely honest. I, I'm useless when it comes to sort of handiwork and hmm. stuff like that. In fact, my, my ex-wives often gave me shit. And they, they, I was, quote, unquote, not a man because I couldn't fix the fucking dryer or the washer or something. I, I said, I don't know. I've just never been. I think I was able to turn the table and said, why didn't you ever learn to fix it? <laughs> oh, that's not something women are supposed to do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's actually funny that you mentioned this. Uh, oh, this is a men's work or a woman's work. So that's something never I never thought until I went out of Spain. In hmm. in Spain, we have also the gender equality is way higher than what I have seen in in the rest of Europe actually. Uh, I think it's because there was never like uh, these gigantic salaries that you can like keep a family uh, with one salary. So you always needed like the two persons working, and this has been like that forever. So I think that actually shielded a little bit this craziness that uh, you can see in the UK or in the US to uh, the Spain. In Spain, yeah, I mean, women have been in the workforce since pretty much the Civil War. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, uh, and yeah, n- nobody will say something, oh yeah, you know, this is a man's work. Oh, this is work. Yeah, but you have to do it. So. Yeah. Better. Well, folks, that seems uh, to be uh, a negative prognosis on, on m- many things, but uh, my guest here is a scientist, so he's committed to the truth rather than or reality rather than, than hopeful lies. So uh, instead of saying yeah, everything's great and Spain has delicious oranges and paella and, and I don't know what else. And no, seriously, food. after one hour bashing my country, I would really like to tell the people, please go and visit. So it's a great place for vacations and we have some very nice uh, nature, great food, and we need your money. So. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's all Spain has left is the uh, the tourism uh, yeah, economy, that's, right? That's the only thing left. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, if you have money, spend it in Spain. It might uh, delay the uh, the inevitable <laughs> collapse uh, because that's all they got going for them. I can't go there because it's too fucking hot and I'll burn in the sun. But uh, if you like the warm weather, actually, I've been to Spain quite a number of times. I mean, I like the the architecture, and I remember looking at the pillars of the University of Salamanca. Oh, and nice. It was very nice, but um, yeah, I mean the weather and yeah, but it, good food too. Toledo too, if you like sword oh, making, yeah. it's a uh, great. I mean, there's some interesting history there, but I wouldn't want to live there. Mm-hmm. So, and apparently my guest doesn't either. Nope. So, <laughs> no. so make make sure to book your vacation to Spain. Anything else you'd like to to add? Maybe well, not really. Not sure, I think. That- okay, yeah, we've been bashing Spain. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, it, 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 we have to be honest. Yeah, if, if Spain, if the conditions of Spain are a certain way, we have to be honest about them. We, we can talk about the glories of Spanish culture and and art and stuff, and I think a lot of people do do that. But uh, the reality is, is Spain for a long time hasn't been a productive country, and there's some serious issues there. And um, just as my talk with CS about Nigeria, which sounds even worse, but uh, that's actually exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember yeah, it could, could be worse. this horror, this lynching of thieves. In the oh, the, the ty- putting tires oh, yeah. around people and lighting them on fire. Oh, man, I mean, uh, that sounds like that doesn't happen in Spain, I guarantee it. It's, uh, yeah. It's a safe yeah, place well, also to, to visit. So. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, uh, you know, this this talk, these, these perspectives talks are all about honest perspectives on what's happening rather than some sort of ideal of how great something is. So, uh, and if you appreciate that, then I appreciate that. And if not, well, sorry. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. That was an uh, interesting conversation. The refugee from darkness, except that there's a lot of sun in the darkness. Oh, yeah, we have plenty of that. Yeah, and uh, I hope you found that interesting. And, yeah, I mean, if you want to uh, at least pr- partially prevent the collapse, then you know, spend your, your money on, on tourism in Spain. That is the great lesson to be learned here. <laughs>